So um, today we have with us Elise Christie. Elise is a British short track speed skater who has achieved extraordinary success in winning multiple European and world championship titles and breaking world records. As well as this, since having a difficult time in the last two Winter Olympics, she has been open and honest about the way it has affected her mental health and greatly increased awareness of this topic in elite sports. So hi Elise, how are you? Hey, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure. So I'll get right into questions. So can you tell me about your sort of journey into, uh, into skating, like how it worked? Um, yeah, like I started as um, a figure skater, which I think is a lot more common in this country. Um, and over time, like kind of loved skating, but really didn't like that. It was like a kind of judge sport. And um, if you want, it was down to an opinion a bit more than like whoever's the best wins. Um, and then, so I, I, I've always liked adrenaline and going fast and racing. So I switched to short track um, later down the line. And um, yeah, I've been on the national team for around 12 years now. Um, so it's, it's been a long one. I'm one of the longest running ones, I think, in Britain. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And how do you think sort of your career is in short track skating has like shaped you as a person? Like how has it impacted your life? I think like there's been a lot of like highs and lows from it um like obviously and I don't know not many people will know the story but um it's it's taught me a lot around resilience and um and dedication to something and I think when I retire I'm going to struggle to find something that I can ever feel is like passionate and driven about because sport becomes pretty much your life (laughs) um and I think until you're in a situation like that you you would struggle to understand how much we actually commit to it and what we put ourselves through. And, um, and it's really the, the positives that I got from it was like um, throughout school, I was always bullied and I felt like by becoming world champion, I kind of like learned a new value to myself. Um, cause I felt like my self-esteem and everything wasn't very good growing up with the bullying and things like that. So I found value in myself and I found something I was good at and kind of like felt like, you know, I proved everyone wrong. Um, But obviously on the journey had a lot of like hardships too. And, um, and like I found it that very hard to value myself outside of skating. So if skating wasn't going well or something went wrong, then actually my self-esteem would drop. And it's probably the biggest lesson I've learned about it in the process is like actually there's you as a person and then you as an athlete I suppose (laughs) yeah I feel like you hear that a lot about sport how it really like teaches you sort of like grit and determination and perseverance do you have any advice on that for people like how do you think sport has taught you to persevere like what advice would you give to people to sort of like push through hard times Um, (laughs) for that I think like one of the there's there's two things like there's, there's the first thing where um I always tended to live in the past and the future and I was always thinking what's gone wrong, what's gone right, what have I got to do? And and then obviously you have to do have to set goals around your future and there is aspects of your life that need to be based on that. But very much so learned that sometimes you have to be in the here and now too. Like um I guess there was times where even when I became world champion, in that moment I went, Okay, yeah, done it, great now what's next instead of being like actually this is a really good defining moment of your life and taking it in um and using that to I guess well be actually proud of yourself in that moment and obviously there's times as well where it's not going to be good in the moment and things are going to be tougher um but I think constantly looking back on what could have happened or looking forward at what could go wrong and living life like that is it, it does make it, you know, it's, it's it's not a nice way to live. And although you like being an athlete, you're very driven by things that go wrong because you're always trying to better yourself. And I think in many aspects of life, people are the same, but sometimes you just do have to live in the moment and actually look at what you've got around you now and be proud of what you've done and happy with what you've got instead of constantly wanting more almost. Um, Cause like it's natural human instinct to always want more, <laughs> but sometimes you have to be, you know, like, in that actual moment and then I think the other big thing for me was like around acceptance of situations that you couldn't change like um there was a long time where I held grudge and anger towards situations in the past 
and I couldn't let them go and they were defining my life and like that's kind of where I mentally like spiraled out of control at points because I just couldn't let go of things and I think accepting that something's happened and you can't change it is such a difficult thing to do but once you know how to do it it can really change your life. Yeah I feel like a lot of people could take a lot from that and sort of like on the touching on the lows have you had moments of I mean you've kind of talked about this but have you had moments where you've sort of considered quitting where you've had a lot of self-doubt where like what was going through your head then and how have you overcome that? Yeah um, I've had quite a few times over the last few years where obviously I've kind of hit bottom of the sport and um, and kind of just been very unlucky in it and and I sat there and I just thought what the heck have I done with my life I've dedicated every minute of every hour for 12 years for this to happen and I just I couldn't if I could go if at that point if you said to me do you want to go back and not do it I'd have been like yeah <laughs> like let's go back and do something else and and like obviously I've sat there and I'm like what can I do I carry on and is it the right thing to do to dedicate even more years or do you just stop now and I guess for me, I seen it as if you if you took the emotion out of it and you put it into fact, and I wrote down reasons to quit, <laughs> there wasn't one. All of them were emotional. They were all like, you know, you feel crap, you've went through crap, it's treated you crap. It's and it was all emotional responses, but there was nothing on that bit of paper that was like you've got an injury that's going to stop you or, you know, you, you financially can't quite cope with it or, you know, cause they can always get a job if things get hard. So for me, I, when I put logic into it, why do I stay? Well, I haven't achieved everything I ever wanted to achieve. Why do I stay in it? I've already given so much of my life to it already. You might as well finish it off properly. And yeah. then also for me, it was like a big aspect around that. I didn't think, you know, we're Olympic athletes and, we're supposed to portray a good image of like perseverance and being determined. Like, you know, we're supposed to be like almost superhumans that show like a really good example. And I didn't think that if I didn't have legitimate reason to stop that that created the right example to people. So I think, yeah, when, when I'm always going through those moments where the mental health is probably getting the better with me and uh, I feel crap and I feel low, I always go back to logic and fact and, and then if there is, you know, if I've sat there that day and gone, actually, you financially, you're never going to be able to do this. You're, you know, you've got this injury that actually you're not going to get over. Then actually my decision might have been different because there was a reason. But I think it's important with not just sport, but every job you're in there. And especially if you're in a very driven job um, at high level, that you have to be making decisions based on actually logically what's going to better you, not emotionally like because emotions can mess with things a lot <laughs> yeah and sort of like on on the highs as well what do you feel like has been for you your proudest achievement in sports so far in skating um I definitely say like becoming the overall world champion in 2017 because there'd never been a European female to ever do it um, and the last something like 15 years it had all been Koreans and Chinese so it was like no one had like stopped that trend and um and it and, and like from an outside perspective the Olympics looks like the biggest deal in sport but actually in short track an overall world champion is the most um respected thing to do because it's four distances so you have to win all four basically or do really well in all four to then get the overall title whereas in the olympics would just be one individual distance so for me like that was the pinnacle and actually would i swap it for an olympic medal no yes financially an olympic medal would have been a lot more impactful on my life but i would never trade that because i reached the top point in our sport that you can and that was the first european female to ever do that and like um and this is what I said, like at that point in 2017, I went, okay, I've done that, move on. Didn't even take it in. So I had to sit there a few years later and be like, actually, you did that and you've got to like, you know, take those moments in there. You do achieve something, whether it's on an exam or <laughs> in your job, any job in the future, like you've achieved something and you're taking steps forward in your life. Yeah. And sort of, yeah, on that, um, 
sort of Britain and Europe in general has historic, historically not been very competitive in winter sports. Do you think that's changing now? Um, it's a difficult question to answer because I remember um, when I was about 19, I just joined the team. Well, I, just, I was just heading to my first Olympics. I remember thinking, Britain's rubbish at sport. Because at that point, we weren't even that good at summer sports. And I was like, and we're really bad at speed skating. And I was like, okay, I'll go to this Olympics. And then, you know, I'm going to go back home and do something else in my life. Because we're never going to make it. So, like, <laughs> and I wasn't. I was never someone that was born, like, born into, I'm going to be an Olympic champion or a world champion. I didn't actually like sport when I was younger. Um, and I wanted to be an aircraft engineer. That was my dream when I was younger. Um, but it was something that just kind of happened to me and I went with it. And when I got back from that first Olympics, I sat there and I was like, yeah, so I did the same thing, I guess, the fact thing where I went, right, is Britain good at this? No. And I suppose, is there a reason that I can't be good at it just because we're not? And I was like, well, no, actually, there's hindrances. Like, you know, we have a lot less money than other countries and we have less ice time. And But I said, like, for every hindrance, there was an answer I could come up with that could see a future in it. So I sat there and I thought, right, I either go home, pack it all up, or I do it and I'm going to win and I'm going to do it properly. And for me, like, it wasn't necessarily about what anyone else thought about winter sport or speed skating or if we were good or bad at it I just looked at that piece of paper and knew that I could do it because there was no reason I couldn't and I just started on a journey of different goals every day that led to the big goal um but it's hard for me to answer about winter sport because we are improving at it but it still lacks a lot of funding like in short track, I'm the only funded athlete in the country right now. So yeah. it's hard to see how and we can develop athletes without funding and things like that. And do you think it's just an issue of funding in terms of like improving into sport or could other stuff be done, done as well? I think there's, there's two aspects because like funding obviously is going to make a big difference because participation will be down if you don't fund it. Because some people just don't have the finances behind them to skate or snowboard or whatever else it is without without funding um but there, there's other aspects to it we're, we're behind the times in terms of like um training and things like that because we didn't really take the sport seriously for quite a while and and that's the same with a few other winter sports and um it's very difficult like I mean we've managed as a team to find a way around it where people now pay to train on the program and they have to work and and it, it is a lot more difficult if you think about we've got to go up against South Koreans who they train from when they're two years old on the ice full time they don't they get paid to do it they have a lot more knowledge than we have um but we try and take advantage of other things you know because like this country is very advanced in ter terms of physiology so we can get some information off safety and information off of skeleton, you know, the, the programs that have got a lot of funding and gain advantage from that. But I think it's, it would be silly to sit here and say that the funding <laughs> doesn't make it easier. It would be a lot easier with funding. Um, but at the same time, I, I think as individuals, if you take a team environment out of it, you are really the one that's in control of whether you win or not. And it's, it's like I said, I made a decision into when I was 19 to go, right, I'm going to go win now. And I think everyone has that in them, but it's not an easy thing to access. For, it's, some people find it easier than others, you know. Yeah. And I guess because of your sort of extraordinary success in the sport and in a Winter Olympic sport, you've almost become a sort of poster girl for British Winter Olympics. Do you find that, is that a lot of pressure? Do you enjoy that? Uh, no. <laughs> I think it was... It, I was naive, I suppose. Like I, I sat there back then and thought, um, right, I'm going to go win a medal. And I didn't think about anything that might come with that or the pressures of being the one that's supposed to win the medal because I think until the, the London Olympics, people didn't pay as much attention to the Olympics anyway. And so then the Winter Olympics was even less. And um, I was very naive and probably didn't plan enough ahead for that. And I think that um, going into Pyeongchang especially, 
um, I did the wrong thing with the media and, and put way too much pressure on myself and and lied a lot because at that time I was harboring a very significant injury and was telling everyone I was in great shape, you know, because that's what we were told to do. And I think that that to me played on my head while I was out there thinking, you know, like actually I'm really struggling right now, but I've got to tell everyone that I'm in the best shape of my life. And and then when I finished, I was like, well, actually, no, I wasn't in great shape, but you look like an idiot because <laughs> you, you've gone out there playing up to the media. So I've learned a lot about ways you can handle that in the future and um, and actually using them to your advantage instead of them taking advantage of you. But pressure is bigger than you realise. I think, like, I, and I always think if you look at Jessica Ellis in the Summer Olympics, like, I don't know how she handled that so well. Like, <laughs> she was the poster girl at home games and that must have been immense pressure. Um, but I think the thing with our sport is because it's so dramatic and it's like NASCAR racing on ice, you know, like we fall, we crash, or we lose we scan like millimeter thin blades and if you strip the edge just on a bit of dust on the ice you go down and it's just like it's such an intense crazy sport um that can be quite unpredictable actually becoming the poster girl for that sport was not the easiest thing to do in the world <laughs> and it's a shame because i think the only time that it's been really watched is twice at sochi and pyeongchang and it's come across as a very silly sport during those times to Britain and it's sad because actually it, when the rules are followed properly it isn't <laughs> yeah and sort of like in general do you think that public pressure is a positive or like negative for athletes because obviously a lot of people speak about it in terms of you know sort of incentivizing them to work harder and like it's really driving you on and you have that support but also it does sound like almost a distraction or like an extra an extra stress on athletes like how do you think that works I think like there's um there's two aspects to it in terms of if you're someone like a football player who's brought up in that environment and understands that comes with the job then from the start you're taught to deal with that and are brought into a system to handle that so in that sense like if you're someone that it suddenly happens to in like like speed skating or a sport that's not so well known then um, it, I don't think it is a good thing because no one around you has prepared you for that. I don't know what I'm supposed to say or not say in the media. Um, no one's told me that. So it's, it, I think it depends on the situation and which sport you're in and, and what you've been warned about or taught to deal with. And But then there's also the, the, you know, some, like I'd say the more arrogant athletes, it would feed their egos and they would, you know, there's quite a lot of short track girls that are very arrogant and very like, you know, they, they want the attention and they want to. But for me, like, it's always been about skating and it's just, you know, not anything around it, not any sponsorship or this or that. I've always wanted to be the best skater in the world. So, like, it did impact me negatively. Um, but I think that's why I then led to open up about my mental health because, I was like told for so long what to say or not to say in the media and act a certain way and not act a certain way. And because no one actually really knew what the best thing to do was. And I just stood there and I went, this is more pressure than the media actually knowing the truth because I, I don't know what I can and can't do. I'm saying the wrong thing, getting in trouble. And so I just went, you know what, stuff it. I'm going to go against everything here and just tell the truth. And I think like that takes so much pressure off of it because and I can sit and watch an interview on the TV now with footballers and boxers and I'm just like, I know you're a liar <laughs> because I've been there, you know, and you can, I can tell the fake interviews from the real ones. But I think, um, yeah, when it go, all it goes down to is if you're a boxer and you're getting all this attention, you're built to deal with it. And, and yeah, that will probably push them on. But I think as someone who came into it being like naive to it and not, um, and not expecting it, I just focused on all the bad stuff that came out of it rather than actually, like you said, there is a lot of nice stuff gets said and you get more nice stuff than you and bad stuff. But as someone that wasn't ready for that, I just kept looking at all these bad headlines and like, oh my God, these people are writing stuff and they don't even know my sport and they don't get it. And so I think like nowadays I'd probably take it in a positive light, but I didn't back then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we all struggle to like fixate on the bad stuff and yeah, yeah. it's really hard to separate yourself from that and especially 
when things are so pressured so sort of more in general like how how is your how has skating for you been affected by covid like how's how have things changed um it was very difficult initially so we ended up off the ice for the longest time I've ever been off the ice in my life we were off seven months with unable to access an ice rink and and it was really frustrating internally because I knew that certain big named athletes were able to get training and people with less funding and 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 like smaller names weren't and it was just like well if they can do it we can do it but they no one was interested in helping us do it you know and and it's just like um, that was where you could see finance made such a difference to the world because if you had the finances to do it, there was a way to do it. Um, so it was it was really bad for us. Like we spent about three months in our garages and <laughs> out running, like trying to train. And I was lucky because I do have a level of UK sport funding um, and managed to buy gym equipment with that because otherwise I wouldn't have even had any gym equipment. <laughs> But some of the team didn't have that access and and it was really difficult because we weren't allowed to obviously share it because you weren't allowed to interact with anyone. And it was it was really frustrating because I could see the rest of the world getting on the ice and training and we were just sat here like doing inline, which is not, nothing like our sport. Um so yeah, that was a stressful period. And since then well, I haven't raced in a year and a half now because there's hardly any competitions run and then the ones that have run we've not been able to go to because um like the world championships was in march in netherlands and the week we were supposed to travel netherlands did a travel ban from the uk <laughs> so we got pulled out last minute and so we, yeah we haven't raced in ages and it, it you know for me i'm sitting here like i'm at the end of my career i've got a year like just under a year left of the olympics now and i've not been able to practice or race in so long and then you've got the other side of it where we've got kids that have you know through 17 to 18 not been able to even start racing and they've got a race Koreans that have been racing since they were like 10 <laughs> so it's just like it's been so frustrating but I'm just thankful now that we are able to get access to the ice and um and we've managed to keep up that up um but yeah it did have a massive negative impact and I think psychologically was very difficult for a lot of athletes yeah, they are. That makes so much sense. And yeah, sort of on the psychological. So you've spoken out a lot and incredibly about acceptance and support for mental health. How do you think we can sort of break down the stigma around that? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one because I, I've obviously spent quite a few, well, about two years now trying to change the stigma around that and, um, and get a more, I guess, like my approach to it is why is it treated differently to physical illness because it's still a physical problem you know it's created by like your hormones imbalance in your brain and 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 obviously different different ones are created for different reasons but it's still physically created so um I don't understand why it's treated differently to having a physical illness and I think like if I had had help a lot sooner and 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 it had been realized a lot sooner I could have been on a much different path to what it took you know it took until I pretty much uh, like reached a really dark moment in, in 2018, December. And, um, and it took until then for me to even realise I needed help because the stigma around it as an athlete is like, and, and, and to be fair, like part of this came from media where, you know, everyone in the media is like, look how resilient she is. She, she just keeps going and going and going. But actually like behind the scenes, I'm like breaking and breaking and breaking because I'm just getting crap thrown at me again and again. And, and like it looked like from an outside perspective that that wasn't affecting me. And I think during the Olympics, it probably didn't because you're just trying to get on with things at that point. Right. Then you come back and then it's just like, ah, <laughs> like that was supposed to be my peak Olympics and what the heck happened. And then I started to spiral. And then the problem is like with the lack of understanding what that's actually wrong with me and not having any treatment, I then like lost my partner and I lost my coach and, and everything just carried on spiraling. And, and for me, like, I sat there and I thought, like, what could someone have done at, that, at any point to stop me getting as bad as I was? And I said, well, actually, just have an awareness of what was really going on. And I think that's why I tried to, you know, and there's a few others, like Kelly Holmes has talked out on her self-harm and stuff like this. And I think it's really important because I, 
I do think like if you read, I think there was a survey done quite recently where um, a lot of top athletes actually end up self-harming um, because they never feel like anything's good enough. So they're constantly striving forward and, and they never feel satisfied, even if they have achieved everything. And it's not all, all athletes, obviously, but there, there is a high number. And I think just admitting that it's okay to feel like that and actually go and speak to someone about it, go and reach out, taking medication isn't an issue, you know. And, and for me, like, it didn't just make me feel better that I was helping people, but it was, like, a bit therapeutic for me to even talk about it because I'd hidden behind this wall of perfection <laughs> trying to act like I'm perfect and everything's perfect in my life for so long and it was actually not good behind the scenes like I remember I, at the Olympic qualifiers in 2017 I had this injury at this point and I was normally meddling like every race and like my leg was just in pain and I ended up in the B final which was like you can get eight from below I think and I walked into the change room my coach was like and me and my coach are like best friends but he was like um it's not that bad considering I remember picking up this yoga and just throwing it at his head and that was like not like me at all and 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 it was just like to get to that point where I like and he just found it funny at the time which is lucky because a lot of coaches wouldn't <laughs> but to get to that level of like drama and no one actually stepping in do anything or like me not even realize that I was spiraling into that extent. And I think it's just so important that people's careers aren't defined or ruined by a little bit of their mental health struggling, you know? Um, but also I think for normal people to understand that even people that you think have this great life, <laughs> like, because that's what it looks like on Instagram or it looks like that on Twitter, that actually it's not always it seems because I could easily look at you know as competitors Instagram and be like oh god she's doing this this and this I'm never going to be her um when actually what you portray on there is a choice of what you want to show not necessarily what's going on yeah and I guess it's an interesting one because for elite athletes you guys get injured all the time and no one would ever say oh don't don't treat your injury don't don't take pain medication or put a cast on it or take some well maybe to maybe not take some rest but <laughs> and then, and then obviously people can behave very differently around mental health. Do you think your perspective as an athlete has helped you think differently about it? Yeah, and I'm still, I'm still learning every day with mine, you know, like there's times where I'll come off my medication, but I'm fine. And then I'll gradually, you know, deteriorate and be like, God, how did not realize I was getting to that point? And, and I, it's a constant learning curve for me, which is why I've always tried to share it with people because, um, I don't, you, you never know who you might save and you can't you can't save everyone um actually one of my boyfriend hung himself not long ago and I had no idea and I sat there thinking you know like I've, I've been to the lowest point in my life before like that and I didn't see it and I think this is where like especially for men like they don't talk out and they don't ask for help and and like I I, I sat there and you know, I've been, and then sport has really helped me because my self-awareness is super high compared to probably a lot of people because we have to be, you know, we have to really understand what our bodies are doing, what our minds are doing and be in control of what they're doing when we're racing. And short track is such a crazy sport that you really have to understand what is going on in like split seconds. So yeah, I, I sit there and I think I'm self-aware of quite often of when I'm deteriorating and when I need whatever. Um, but like you said, <laughs> I, I was at the point in 2018 where I was like if I take medication people are going to think I'm mad and that I'm not strong enough to do this sport anymore because that's what my, everyone's perception of me is that I can just get on with this and I can do it and I can and I sit there and I'm like actually you're right like with the injury you know I wouldn't have just ignored an injury I wouldn't have just I would have dealt with it and I think um that's that's the most important thing is if you don't deal with it it gets worse and worse and worse and like any physical injury would um but yeah I've, I'm, I'm still learning every day and so I think like for me like I've got a big in, um interest now into men's mental health because of what happened because I'm like actually do they need even more pushing and more help because 
um, the suicide rate in men is so much higher than it is in women, even though attempted suicide is higher in women. So I think it's because, you know, when men do it, they, they, they've just had enough and they've not dealt with anything. And I'm really trying to understand <laughs> the male brain and how it works and how we can influence men to ask for help more often or, you know, go and get the help they need and tell us they're suffering and they're struggling. Yeah. And also kind of, do you think elite sport is maybe less receptive to talking about these issues as a sort of institution? Like, do you think they're not, you know, interested in talking about it or they need to talk about it more? I think there's a few things like where even now I I worry about being completely honest with the team around me because I don't want them to react in a negative manner. So if I'm struggling, I don't want them to be like, oh, we can't push her in training or, um, or is this going to be too much for her? Do we have to take her out? And, it, and it's never the case. Like for me training, like it helps me. It doesn't hinder me. And, <laughs> and it, it, you know, it gives me a routine. It gives me positive things to work towards. But um, I think, I think there is still a lot to learn in elite sport around that. Um, you know, we have sports psychologists and we can easily get access to clinical and things like that. But, I think, yeah, it can it can be perceived completely wrong in sport where um, they think maybe your sport, it, your, your mental health is driven by your sport, but actually it's not. <laughs> it's driven by actually what's going on with you at that point in time. And, and, um, and, and I think a lot of athletes are scared to go, I'm struggling. Or, you know, because you've got competitors, you've got to show a certain thing to a persona, and 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 if they see a weakness, they're going to attack that. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's a lot of work still to do in elite sport. And once I'm taking a step back from it this year with the games coming up, um, so because you know I need to focus on myself for a year. But after that, I think that's one of my goals is to put a lot of work into the sports side of it. And, and get people more help because there's probably a lot of athletes who never reach the full potential because they're battling demons behind the scenes. Yeah. And so you've spoken a lot about um, your experiences with social media and how that's affected your mental health in particular trolling. So how do, how has that worked for you? Like, how do you think that's shaped your sort of your journey with mental health? Um, I think I wouldn't say like I would have never styled as much as I did without it <laughs> but it's like it, it had the biggest impact on me like and that was because like you know I, I was bullied growing up I actually left one school and then went to another and then got bullied again <laughs> so like I ran away from that almost and came down to England and started a new life new career and made a new name for myself and and then I thought I'd done all that and was doing really well like started to win medals at a high level and then and then what happened in 2014 happened and I was like I didn't ever get away from it you know it's back and I and it was it was worldwide public news this time and I just I sat there and said how is anyone ever supposed to deal with this level of abuse and like if I had seen someone else going through it like I Caroline Flack recently is probably a good example is I just sat there and gone Oh, it's just media it's just people saying crap like but if you put yourself in that position and like even if I sit here now and empathize towards her situation you know she was sitting there knowing that the media is making her out to be this horrific person when actually she's just really struggling and she had to sit there and deal with that and and at that moment you can understand why someone might choose to go because actually facing life and what and what everyone's saying is more painful than just going and that and that that's horrible and so for me I was in I I didn't think about killing myself but there was points where I just wanted to run away you know like and start a new life again like I had the first time around and moved to America where no one knows me or you know and 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 it was like that but I think I was lucky because I was an athlete I had I could put that level of I guess fear and anger into my skating so I was just like I just need to get better at this and better at this and better at this and that was where at that point it was healthy for me in some ways because I didn't ever get suicidal and things like that but actually I was just avoiding the actual problem but I thought you know what it'll be fine because I'll go to the next Olympics win a medal and then everyone will shut up 
<laughs> and then I became world champion and I was going in the right direction, but none of it was actually healthy. You know, it was all just avoidance. And, and then I got to the Olympics and obviously it happened again. <laughs> and I was just like, oh boy, now what do I do? Like, and I couldn't keep avoiding it and putting it in skating anymore. Like it got too big. And I, I was just like, I could sit there from that same perspective and understand why people were saying what they said because they've only seen me skate twice in eight years <laughs> and it's not gone well irrelevant to what re the reason is behind it and I sat there and I was just like and, and then I just thought I can't deal with this and I just went numb and that was it like I felt nothing for quite a while where I just and I couldn't mo motivate to train so I wasn't training I'd lost that so I was just like I think it, it's so underestimated what it's actually like to sit there and be abused publicly like and and and, and face media the wrath of the media so irrelevant so like you could have said 75 percent of it was good and 25 percent of it was crap it didn't matter to me all i could see was that and the fact that i'm a failure i'm this i'm that and i'm sitting there going i know logically i'm not because i'm a world champion and i'm a world record holder and i've done this and i've done all this stuff I trained my ass off but I'm like but all I could focus on was that actually maybe I'm wrong even though my facts were there and I think it's just it's so uh, if I could go back now would I just have turned social media off from 2014 on yes um should I turn it off now no because I think I've learned a lot from it and and that my I see the mental health journey I'm on is really important for other people so that's the only reason I have social media. It's not from an ego perspective or uh, that I think it's important because I think it's crap. <laughs> but um, I think if I can save one life, that's a life saved. And, and, and I think like now I fight back at what's said, you know. So I think the other week, the Sun posted something about me working at Pizza Hut because I wasn't funded. And actually I had gone out to get a job at Pizza Hut because it wasn't necessarily pizza but I went out to get a job because I'd never had a job and I had some time and I wanted to experience having a job like outside of skating irrelevant to what job it was it was a journey for me where I decided to have a life outside of skating for a while and um instead of being a Lisa speed skater I was gonna be <laughs> at least the pizza driver so you know and um and they made it out too bad. And instead of just taking that and being like, oh God, I look so stupid. I sat there and I was like, I corrected it on social media because that's what I've learned is that actually they then look stupid, not me. <laughs> but it's, it, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and I think like, as you see with Caroline before she passed, she'd come off social media and put a statement about coming off. And that's not something I would ever do now because um, I'd rather actually share the truth <laughs> if that makes sense then perception yeah and I think I mean I guess that's what social me media needs is more people showing the truth rather than the kind of perfect, perfect <laughs> ideal do you think that's that's what's important in making social media a more welcoming space or do you have any other ideas yeah I think like some people sit there and go shall we just ban social media I mean that's just unrealistic and it's never going to happen and ideally yes you'd ban it to under the age of 18 for starters because I don't think it's healthy for kids to be on um but it's always going to be there and people are always going to lie about their age and get access to it and things like that so but I think the narrative needs to be controlled a lot better on it and and I think Instagram is definitely now I actually like Instagram the most because I think for me personally it's the least damaging because obviously sports stuff's more thingied on Twitter but um, I see it as most damaging for kids and teenagers and people with bad self-value because the images you see on there are not real. I mean, I don't think I post, I mean, I don't edit my pictures or anything. I can't be arsed with that. But <laughs> I will like, you know, occasionally put a filter on a picture and think, oh yeah, I look better there than I normally do, you know, but <laughs> everyone does it. And, and to the extent of like, they're trying to make themselves like these celebrities they see or they're trying to make themselves have this expensive lifestyle and then they're going to get themselves into debt or and this one that really gets to me is that gambling is advertising sport like you know footballers wear um bet bet 365 on the tops and they're sponsored by that and i think that's so wrong because the amount of kids that watch football 
and they're like what's better 365 you know and you grow up knowing what it is and you gradually you know that can that can lead to a gambling addiction and I think addiction like it's not something I suffer from but I can see how people do suffer from it and the, the extent of you know damage that can cause and I, I I think there needs to be something done about social media because there's too much like if you just said to me how do you gamble when I was 10 or 15 I'd have no idea but nowadays you can see that's so easy you know and, and it's wrong it's not like it, the world shouldn't be able to see all this stuff as easy as they should like a 13 year old shouldn't go onto Instagram and see you know a, a perfect body in a bikini that should, that should have been like say for you know, prohibited sites and things and stuff like that so I just think there's such a fake world out there now and and we're advertising the wrong things um and it's not like you know I've I've been offered money to do shoots before but I do I don't see that as the right thing to do because I don't want to promote that I want to promote actual real life and a healthy life and and what actually goes on and I think um Obviously, this year, like I said, my social media will slightly changed because I don't want my opponents knowing the ins and outs of my mental health right now. But um, and that's again where, like, there you go, you're going to get a fake image of me over the next year, probably. Um, but that 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 is what's damaging about it is it's just I could easily look at times that people post on there and be like, oh god, there's no point in me even going to this Olympics because it's all fake, <laughs> you know. So I think it's just it's needing that someone's needing to really get control of what goes on in there, I think. Yeah, and I guess, so that's kind of on how social media affects people as like people and seeing everyday lives. But how would you say social media has also affected like being in sport as like a positive experience for athletes or does it also have drawbacks? Obviously it offers opportunities for sponsorships, et cetera, but also it seems to have kind of amped up the pressure in a new way. Yeah, I think um, obviously, like, and this isn't impacting me massively because as winner athletes, we don't get a lot of sponsors, but it has been very, um, you can see the positive effects it's had on sponsorship in a lot of athletes because you still need to be like, you know, like football and maybe the top athletics lot and, and cricket that would get sponsors. And now you can see there's a lot more variety to who gets sponsorship because of what they're able to promote. But also like I get a lot of free stuff off social media because I can just post a picture and they're happy with that you know and and for that kind of aspect it's been really good and I think sharing your journey in your life um a lot easier like you know before you had to do a book or an interview you can post a little thing and share a bit of your life with people and I think like obviously that's nice it's flattering that people are interested so there is there is an ego boost at like you know having a good following on social media of course and a lot of people that actually follow you are fans so they would normally write nice things to you and and you know that that can pick you up on a bad day you know if I'm having a bad day and someone writes something nice under a picture of course that's going to cheer you up like um you wouldn't be human if it didn't so there is there is really good aspects to it as well and I think that is part of it is trying to focus on the good aspects of it um but there is again added pressure because you, you know, you've got social media platform to share what's going on in your life. Now, if I go to an event, if I'd gone to an event five, six years ago, no one would have really known I was there, <laughs> you know, because short track isn't heavily advertised. And um, so I wouldn't have really shared results. And now I go to an event and if it's not been good, I have to then be like, oh, it didn't go that well, you know, or so there is ramped up pressure from that as well. But um, I mean, that doesn't impact me negatively. But I, I could see how, especially with a bigger name, how that could impact negatively. Um, and I think it must be really hard for footballers because every match they do, <laughs> they're getting scrutinised. And like people are so passionate about football, like they're the ones playing it, you know. And I think <laughs> to be the footballer that misses the penalty, it must suck. <laughs> like, you know, the abuse they get on social media after, it's got to be very difficult. But at the same time, they sit there with these pay packets from sponsors where you're kind of like, well, <laughs> if you didn't have your social media, you probably wouldn't be getting all this sponsorship either. So I think, you know, there is obviously pros and cons to it. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And so now just I have a couple of student questions people have submitted. So Anna from Murray Edwards College has asked, 
how does your funding work as an athlete? Um, so I've got UK sport funding and what happens is every year the program funding, which is called a medal sport plan, if you're an individual athlete, but it'd be program funding if it funds a whole program. Um, so my medal sport plan would be reviewed based on results which has been very difficult through COVID. <laughs> so I've had to do a lot of work this year to submit evidence that I'm skating okay because there's no results to do that. Um, so we'd submit that and that would determine the amount of funding you get for the year in terms of like to travel and compete and equipment, not that it covers a lot of equipment, but and then ice time and coaching. And then I then get a personal eight, what's called an APA, which is then based on results. So you get what's called like A card, B card, C card, D card, E card, F card. And that's based on if you've meddled or not meddled and then top eight and all that. So it is all very like, and, and the thing with UK sport is once you hit A and B card, you can never go down. So if you ever don't hit a result, <laughs> your funding's gone. <laughs> so it's quite, um, like I've never been in that situation. I've always hit my targets. So it's not been so bad, but yeah, there's some athletes where they get to be card and they think, yes, I'm going to, you know, but then let's say something happens and they get knocked over and they, and then that's it, funding gone. So it's quite, it's quite a cutthroat, um, especially when we don't have sponsors because obviously other sports have sponsors, but yeah, it's, um, it's all based on resource basically. Yeah. That sounds very intense. <laughs> and Thomas from Downing asked, how are you feeling about the 2022 Winter Olympics? <laughs> um I know like a lot of people have asked this and a lot of people think I'm dreading it because of what's happened recently but I'm actually really looking forward to it like because this time I know it's my last games and um I you know I couldn't do this for another four years again <laughs> and I'm just I want to go out and do you know like if I finish an event that will be the first event I ever finish at an Olympic Games because I've either got DQ'd or fallen in every single one which is so sad um, so for me, I'm just really looking forward to going out there and showing that I didn't give up. And um, and my body isn't as good as it used to be, but I'm still producing the same times and um, and, and I'm on the right markers for meddling. But for me, this time, it's just so much important to actually enjoy it um, and, and, and show the good example of like, you know, I've come back and I've tried again. And hopefully this time it's it's paid off. I've done it, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, just sort of on a few final questions, sort of looking towards the future apart from the Olympics. Are you working on anything else right now? Like, sort of yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm working a lot. This is one of the big things for me because I was so, I'm a Lisa Speed Scare and that's all I am. And I got sat down after my bad moment in 2018 and, and there was like, um, you need to have at least you as well. And I was like, well, I don't even know who that is. Like, and I had to sit there and go through it all and figure it all out. Um, but I've written a book, so that's actually finished. It's, or we're just finishing off like the punctuation and all that, you know, like all the little bits now. So I've written a book on, I guess it's, it, it, it's an insight into real life, what actually happened. And, and there's a lot of things that I went through that a lot of people don't know. And then, it's also an insight into how, like you've been asking me today, but more detailed of how you actually get on with it when it's crap and how you get through that and things. So it was actually finished. <laughs> but um, obviously with what happened recently with my boyfriend, there's a bit of extra information going in there. Um, but yeah, so I've been working, that was the biggest thing I was working on, but I've also trained via PT, um, which I don't want to do long term. <laughs> okay, I know it's such an obvious thing to go into, but I think it's an easy thing for me to do after I finish my career that I can make money from. And I think that's really important that I have that stability. Um, but long term, it's it's not my dream. Um, I do want to be in the police force. <laughs> that's my goal in the long term. But um, I'm doing the PT first and then I'll be looking into training for that. Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> what was the process of working on your book like? Was it emotional did you find it difficult yeah I mean okay I, I wrote some of it myself but I've also had the ghostwriter obviously and um and there's points where I've had to tell someone something that I've never told anyone else in my life you know and stuff that I've went through where I'm like do I actually am I ready for publicly people to know that that happened to me 
Um, and then there's also points where I've had to not be very nice about people, and it, but it's not I'm not being nice. It's the truth of what happened, and it, it you know it's hard for me because I'm not someone that get like deals with that very well. I don't like people to feel down or feel crap, and but it, it I've had to tell the true story, and that's one thing I learned. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a long part. It's taken about a year and a half, um, and then we had to find the publishers, obviously, and get all the deals in place and all that. And then I did my photo shoot. That was the best bit was the photo shoot recently. And I like it. So we've been picking the cover image and things like that. Um, but it's it's been probably in some ways very therapeutic, but one of the hardest things I probably had to do. Um, because like I said, up until Pyeongchang Olympics, I was like told what to say and how to act and what to promote. And so that only changed very recently. So then I sit there and have a tell-all book. And like, um, I know when he contacted me recently about um, what happened to my boyfriend, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can put that in there or talk about that. But actually, like, you know, I said this would be the truth. So um, so for me, it has to, you know, that had to go in as well. And it's just been very, yeah, it's been very challenging the last few weeks for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lise. That was such an informative and interesting conversation. I <laughs> so too. Um, just to say for anyone watching our upcoming events, we have a panel on Windrush on Monday with ATS. We have Lord Sugar speaking on Tuesday, a panel on the Arab Spring the next day. Um, Steven Pinker speaking on, when, on the same day after that on Wednesday. And then a debate on 2020s on Thursday and David Miliband coming on Friday. So yeah, a packed week and lots of other exciting events. But yeah, thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>